It's awfully quiet in here. <laughs> Anticipation. Cow. Well, I guess we're going to begin, apparently, from the silence of it. Um, my name is John Burns. I am a botanist with uh, the Conservation Department of New England Wildflower Society. And we've come here today to learn a little bit about uh, Eshqua Natural Area, Eshqua Bog. Might not be the best term, but we'll understand that a little better after today. So we're going to look at, at uh, some of the things about it. I learned today that the bog itself is on the other side of town as I pulled in more towards Woodstock, thinking, oh, okay, the library, it's going to be right in here somewhere. <laughs> of course, it wasn't at all. So uh, with that, if you'll just tolerate me turning now and again to poke things forward, uh -oh, poke things forward here. Uh, uh, Esqua Bog has, has a bit of a presence on the landscape. People know about it attracted to it, and of course a publication, uh, a lot of publications out there about it. It's owned by New England Wildflower Society and the Nature, uh, Nature Conservancy. And, uh, and we work together in managing this really special area in order to bring it to the public and uh, have it be available to you. And uh, it's got quite a lure, and of course, probably as many of you know, the orchids are the real attraction to the, uh, the Fen, as it's more appropriately called. Mm -hmm. So in order to talk about this, we need to have a little bit of background, a little understanding about what it is that we're going to visit or look at. I hope you join uh, Amanda Weiss of the Wildflower Society tomorrow for a field trip there. And if you don't, you're going to learn a little bit tonight about the Fen. And um, uh, hopefully that will change your experience and your outlook on the property there. Um, hopefully most of you know we're up here on Garvin Hill, uh, just really on the border of Heartland and Woodstock, mm -hmm. and uh, just off of Heartland Hill. This is kind of the general property. That's the parcel that we own uh, off of Garvin Hill Road, and the boundary is right up uh, uh, very much on the north end there. I hope you can see things all right, uh, uh, right there. We're looking at the topography here. We can see, as you as you might know, these are contour lines, or topographic lines here, to describing the uh, terrain. And between each of these uh, is a change in elevation, and you kind of have to have a general idea of what's going on in order to know whether it is up and down. But this is a top of a hill, and this is a downward slope in a more flattened area here. This big broad area means there's very little change in topography between here and there. So this is pretty much flat, and this is where uh, the wetland is, right in this area in general. And of course it continues down below there. <coughs> I'm going to wait just a second here to let a few more people in. Hi folks, come in and just get settled in. Uh, we're just getting started. Haven't missed any of the good stuff yet. <laughs> Friends meeting. Okay, we've been talking about the Fen, otherwise known as Esqua Bog. Here's a topographic uh, view of it. We're just looking at the parcel that's owned by the Nature Conservancy and New England Wildflower Society. And you can see here we have a forested area surrounded here and here you see a bit of an opening here which suggests something's changed and that is uh, itself the fen itself. And we're looking at that property here more in a topographic line. Um, here we can see a color differential differentiation between the more solid deciduous forest around it and this being what appears to be a little bit of a shrub swamp in the area and that is our rich fen. I did a little playing with Google Earth to kind of look at this. It's so cool technology. And so uh, I zoomed this, and we're looking now uh, towards the south. Uh, here's the road, Garvin Hill Road down this way, and we're looking out. And we can see that, and this is important to understand, the context of where we are in the landscape here. Here we're seeing a nice high ridge with the fen. This is the fen in this whole area here, and it's important in very 
common for this kind of thing. First of all, this kind of wetland is known as a rich fen. And uh, I'll get into details about some of the different fens. But we can see here that starts with a um, uh, 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 somewhat steep hill to the west. Comes down, we have a flat plateau to about this area and the road, and then it drops off again. And that's important in a little bit diagnostic as far as that hillside goes. As many of you know, we need to set a little bit of a context here. And I think most people are really familiar with the Ice Age, you know? Long time ago, a mile and a half thick, we had ice a mile and a half thick above us in the nor whole north area here. This was known, uh, and really throughout the temperate regions of the world, both poles, the north and the south, but we think of the north mostly, and uh, the glaciers um, basically cold enough that we had more precipitation than would melt and, and evaporate, and uh, especially snow and ice, and it built up such that we get a cap on the globe, right? We think of it as the ice age, glacial period, it was a great time for camping and uh, <laughs> being out there with the family. You know, it's known as the Wisconsin Glacial Period. Now, a lot of people hear about the glaciers receding. So this is very large ice masses that covered continents. We're talking continental sheets here. They put enough pressure, had enough mass to them and weight that they pushed down the continental plates of which the world is made, the, the earth anyway, is made. And, um, um, and of course, they're going to slide downhill, which in this case was a little bit north-south, and um, move down to what we know of today as Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, Long Island, and stopped moving from there. In the process of moving somewhat north to south, they are uh, putting a lot of pressure on the mountain ranges that were previously underneath perhaps as large as the, what we know as the Himalayas today. And uh, if you can imagine those ice sheets over those mountain ranges, grinding them. And of course, with the, with the frozen ice, they're going to pick up some of these rocks and use those like a very coarse sandpaper, scour the landscape, and be moving that material along with it. Scrape down the mountain ranges, move the material with it, and of course, there was no reason for them to move back uphill, so there is no receding of the glaciers as far as them moving south to north. But instead, where are they going to begin to melt but in the south where it is warmer first? And so the glaciers did not move south to north, but instead started to melt in the south. And of course, there's lots of ground matter, ground up rocks and soil that they've moved along and picked up and carried uh, and as it melts, it just drops where it is. And if they drop in big enough piles, it forms Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, Elizabeth Islands, all of these smaller islands, and good parts of, uh, of Long Island. And uh, So that's a little bit of a context. We know that it got to this range. And of course, throughout from here to, towards the shore, it is also going to drop this material on the landscape that remains. All right? And uh, we need to go a little bit further back, though. That's not enough. We need to go back. Many of you know about plate tectonics. The, uh, the Earth made up of numerous plates that uh, over a molten magma core of the Earth. And these things are floating around and constantly moving. And we know that the shifts of these plates uh, <coughs> cause what we know as, as earthquakes. And, um, and so, over a geologic time span, Earth was rearranged. The plates were in different places. What we know of as the continents were different. And so we have an, uh, a time period where at least the above the water land masses were all together, and we have named that period uh, Pangaea. And um, over time, these land masses moved. Want to see that again? Yeah. It's kind of cool, isn't it? <laughs> These things moved. Well, oh, let me go back. I hope I can get it to stay for just a split second. I can't really. But the neat thing is, just look at how these things just knit right in, right? We see South America just tucked oh in nicely under uh, 
Africa, and North America right in here as well. They're all in there. But these things didn't just move once, they moved several times. And um, so we can still see today that this would fit nicely in there, this moves nicely with that. And this movement in, plate, in uh, uh, tectonic plates is crucial because there's, of course, material in between. We think of it today as just the waters in between, the great oceans. But, of course, there is substrate below that, which is important. Because this is a, we're, we're first of all, in this wonderful little animation here, this is geologic time happening like that, right? Which is very exciting. But you have to think of it that, that in, the, in the millions of years, in this process of plates moving around, that there is life existing in between, in the waters, there is um, um, ocean life, um, your, your, your clams and mussels, or whatever those early versions were, trilobites, and, um, and various animals living in the ocean, of course, living, consuming, dying, leaving resources on the bottom, decomposition, this whole cycle of life going on. It's important because of what these animals are made of, and a large part of it is calcium. And, um, and so one of the things that happens is that as animals die, they die and go to the bottom, especially the shellfish. And if we could just focus for a moment on the um, uh, calcareous things here, the seashells and, uh, and even the corals and this kind of thing. And they tend to be in, uh, 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 go to the bottom and uh, break apart with the wave action. Those things tend to settle out on the bottom. We've seen the plates moving around. Now let's look at it from a side view a little bit. There are oceans between here, all right? The Iapetus Ocean. And these are land masses in between. And they're not necessarily continental. Some of these are, are smaller. But they're a little bit important. Because it's amazing, uh, over the time period here, we had a pre-impact, should we say, coast of North America, all right? And then over about 350, 400 million years ago. And then over time, plates are moving around. And even on a smaller level, these, these plates are having impact on our North American larger continental plate. All right? And here's how it works. It's pretty neat. Ocean in between, those great little dead clams and things like that down there. And what happens is these man masses are moving along like this. All right? And look at this white area here. It's going to bash up against the east coast. And if you can imagine that following through with several others, behind it here, the next one here, the Avalon terrain, we're going to have several impacts digging up the ocean bottom, amassing also um, a land mass that was in between and compacting that. At the same time, there's a lot of stuff going on here uh, with the edge of plates, and so we get the squirting of igneous intrusive or magma from below the earth that also squirts up in between. And these kinds of things are important because they have, um, um, they, they are building the substrate of New England. New England has a fascinating um, uh, geologic history. And uh, here we're seeing that same kind of layout, line up here again. We're seeing a little volcanic activity with nice volcanic drawings. We're seeing buildup of oceans here. And we're seeing that some plates are going underneath while others are building up. And it's really fascinating. I'm going to leave a lot of that for your homework or hit my course the next time I offer it uh, <laughs> through New England Wildflower Society. But New England's had a fascinating history of, of numerous collisions of large land masses. And what it has done is when these things happen, they, they impact in and sometimes move away. But we're going to have what are known as accretions adding to the continents. And uh, over time, we have the landmass adding to it. We've got the ocean in between adding more material. And it's happened three, four, five times in our geologic history. And it's resulted in a fascinating geologic profile of New England. And thus, our Berkshire range, or Taconic range first, is very interesting, with uh, a bit of an ocean bottom range. 
with a Berkshire range, with another bit of range, with a little bit of, of igneous intrusive rock, if you know about the trap rock of Connecticut and those higher um, uh, ridge tops that are down there of, um, of, of uh, columnar basalt. All, right? all of these are bringing different kinds of nutrients to the stage at hand. Here's a very simplified version of these kind of separations going across east to west. That's Africa. <laughs> That's a piece of African rock up there. As many of you know, how many people here from New Hampshire? All right, there's one. She got in. I don't know what happened. How about the difference when you cross this river, the difference in geology, the difference in politics, the difference in people. <laughs> Night and day difference, isn't it? It's astounding. It's astounding. And if you continue to cross there, it, it is interesting again. This is reflected as well in what uh, TNC and the uh, USGS has identified as ecoregions. So this would be, let's look at the soils, let's look at the rocks, let's look at the dominant vegetation and come up with general descriptions. And uh, this is at the, at the four level here. And we're seeing the same reflection here that's reflecting the geology of New England. And it's fascinating because it does relate to Eshquibog as well. So, th so that's kind of the act one, and setting the stage, all right, because the breakdown of that bedrock geology is the food for our plants and really going to set the stage as far as the chemical nature of what is going on at Eshquibog. So first of all, if you don't know and haven't been there, Eshquibog is open to the public. You can go and visit there anytime. Um, we ask you to be kind of nice, walk gently there, not collecting a lot, leave only footprints. Um, there is a bit of a trail system. This is a boardwalk through the, uh, the, the center. We, you know, we know that people really want to see a lot of the neat plants that are there. And uh, you know, it's important to go around it as well and see the boundary. So there's a boardwalk across here, a trail system around it. Don't forget the uplands. Cool stuff. A lot of neat stuff up there. And, uh, but of course, uh, I'd, I'd like to think that you wouldn't mountain bike there or bring motorized vehicles. But uh, really a special area. Here you see that wetland situated, again, that big, broad, uh, flat plain before it drops off again. Hillside leading into that. That's going to be very typical of a rich fen. So, bogs, fens, peatlands, what are these terms? We hear about these all the time, and people kind of think, a bog is a bog is a bog. It's got sphagnum moss, and there's people buried on the bottom. <laughs> you know? Things don't break down. Understand that this process and a lot of these kinds of communities that we're seeing um, um, exist in other parts of the world and are much older. Those, many of those European bogs are much older than ours, from, and, and to a certain extent uh, were established during previous ice ages. Right? Glacial periods. Um, if I can try to just bring you a little bit up to speed here, uh, we have our land formation. That's a little geologic time, a little smaller time, maybe glacial time. The glaciers came to a certain extent, wiped our slate clean here. Pun intended, slate clean. Um, wiped us clean. No more, no earthworms, uh, not much vegetation. Everything was pretty much, we're starting all over again, right? We we'll have the early colonizers there. Lichens, moss come in to change the substrate, change the geology, break that down to make more nutrients available for other plants. Um, over time, simple plants grow. Um, as they grow, die, and break down, makes more nutrients available for the larger, higher, more complex plants of shrubs and trees. Uh, this process occurred previously in Europe and in Europe, they, uh, you, know, the, you hear about mining peat and peat bogs being, being hundreds of feet deep. That's, they were from a previous ice age and uh, uh, are much older in a longer process, but very, very similar. So um, one of the things is that we've talked about the geologic stage. We've talked just briefly there about the changes that happen after a glacial period, for example. And then depending on the setting, depending on the terrain and the makeup of the bedrock, 
a different scenario plays out. And um, sometimes it's not as clear as this is this and this is that. All right? By that I mean that it's a bit of a spectrum when we're looking at peat communities. And depending on what the substrate is, what the terrain is like, and the hydrology, things are going to play out a little bit differently. And uh, so that kind of sets the stage. All right? We have some things that are uh, people t often call true bogs. They're dominated by perhaps larger shrubs, maybe this tall, other times by black spruce more typically, or even a pitch pine uh, uh, feeling with shrubs under, underneath. The, sp the spruce and the pitch pine have sedges play a large role in both of those. And of course, uh, when you change altitude significantly, go up two, three, or four thousand feet, we're again going to have um, an environmental pressure of the cold and the short growing season that is involved in the alpine communities. So there are bogs where we think of this kind of community. Uh, it may be an old lake. Sphagnum starts to grow. It floats. Um, uh, many of these areas may be uh, somewhat isolated hydrologically, so water is there, but there are not streams in and out, or very little. There's very little change in flow. And if I could use salt water as an analogy that I think you can relate to here, and tea, if you think about it, rain comes down, hits the ground, the ground initially is made up of brown leaves, dead leaves, that is basically the same as tea. From those leaves, we get tannins and tannic acid, and they dissolve like tea into a dark brown water, which goes then will flow into a lake or this kind of area. If it is limited in its um, uh, uh, inflow and outflow, then we get tea sitting there, and the water evaporates if you can imagine salt water, the water evaporates and the salt stays. Water evaporates and the tannic acid stays. And the acid stays and it's going to build up and over time become very acidic. We're talking acidic as, as acidic as vinegar and lemon juice. 3, 3.5 <coughs> would be a very acidic area. And um, at times, sphagnum, a neat moss that's very absorbent, happens to float. I think it uh, absorbs three times its weight in water. It's pretty, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, can grow in this kind of setting. And it can start to grow and float and grow out there. And it will continue to grow. But because of the highest acid levels, bacteria and fungus don't live in this environment very well. Those are our key decomposers. And so many, thing, many times, plants and animals don't break down in this kind of setting. Uh, of course, that process is the process for which animal and plant remains release nutrients back to the community to be available to other plants and, and animals. So in a true bog situation, we have very little nutrients, very, we have few decomposers, and thus very few de um, uh, nutrients available to the plants and animals. The sphagnum makes it, can make a very large mat which can build up and build up and be feet thick, but this stuff underneath here that dies doesn't break down, all right, because there are no decomposers. It's so acidic and it goes anaerobic. Uh, it can build up quite a significant mat that can build up over an area. Over time, you can have some plants, some larger plants, trees and shrubs get in there. Uh, the seeds will grow. They'll start to grow. There's a little bit of nutrients. They grow up, they grow very, very, very slowly, and they grow up, but they just can't make it. Not enough nutrients for a spruce tree to grow more than this. And it grows, and it dies, and it falls over, and it falls over on top of the moss, which is exposed to water, air, and bacteria, and fungus, and all that, and it can break down. And it breaks down, forming nutrients available to more trees, more plants, more spruce trees, they grow up, now they're 9 feet tall, same process. 12 feet tall, 15 feet tall. So you can get a buildup of organics on top of the sphagnum bog and begin to get shrubs that will maintain a longer lifespan, and eventually trees. 
And that's pretty much how these spruce and pine true kind of bog areas form. Alpine peatlands are a little different, but these fens are really interesting and quite a bit different. And that's what we're going to look at today. I'm going to focus on the rich fen, but I'm going to do a little description of some of these others. Let's look at these. So here's that peat mat, mat going across a more boggy area or a poor fen, build up of peat. That could be quite deep. I've uh, been on some that uh, are uh, 8, 10, 12, 15 feet deep of sphagnum moss. This is where the people are buried, all right? <laughs> this stuff, the bog man. All right, now you're down in there, you leave them there, the skin, the hair, the clothes remain because it's anaerobic, no bacteria, no fungus, and they're pickled. The pH is 3.5, vinegar, they're pickled, and they're in this kind of setting, all right? And um, so that's more of a black spruce, peatland or bog um, kind of setting. Here's a pitch pine setting, a bit similar, Forms kind of similarly. I'm going to generalize it just so we focus on the rich fan. But you can get shrubs as well. Very interesting communities there. You know, In an alpine setting, because it's so cold, that decomposition process doesn't really happen. We get it, everything on kind of a much smaller scale. We do get some sphagnum moss growing. We get lots of sedges. But we get a little bit more of this community because uh, it just takes, and they're, they're just fighting such environmental pressures in order to survive at all. Um, here's a great black spruce bog here, uh, which is really neat. It, uh, it enables us to see, uh, I think I included some pictures here. Uh, this is all black spruce in the background here, all right? More around the edge than in the central area. We get some shrubs. This is all sedges, all right? It's a grass-like uh, kind of species cotton grass, some grasses, more sedges, um, and, and then smaller plants in this area. And uh, occasional pools in here as well. It's a very interesting area. I think I included this. That, this one in particular is very interesting. It introduces a, a, a concept that is a little bit important in rich fens, which Eshqua is, all right? <laughs> Very often in most wetlands, we have a central channel that's a stream. The stream comes in, it flows through the middle, typically stays open and flowing in the middle, and we can identify that. In these fens, it's often quite different, especially a rich fen. Instead, what is happening is we're getting kind of a laminar or overall flow across the whole area. It's flowing through the plants and very slowly. That's important, okay? Uh, this is a neat one here in northern New Hampshire here. Uh, it's a pattern fen, and there are these little things called uh, strings and flarks. These uh, areas where you have raised areas where nutrients have been able to build up, and these areas where the nutrients are not. Uh, the interesting thing on these things is that, and I'm looking down one of these things, the Uphill to downhill gradient on this is right here. It's going this way, all right? Meanwhile, the string is going this way. A pattern fin, it's very interesting. Uphill, downhill, this way. The strings all flow towards more towards the center, and the flarks are the higher areas on the end. It's a fascinating place. Loads of neat things here. Sedges, grasses, rushes, uh, uh, um, uh, pitcher plants, sundew, wonderful orchids, absolutely fabulous place, all right? So, first thing to understand is that idea of slow moving water across the whole surface. Here's another important thing here, is the connection with minerals. This is very important for most fens. Okay, I'm gonna to start to set, set the stage now, particularly for a rich fen, which is what Eshqua is. Rich fens are dependent on calcareous soil, soils of uh, uh, rocks that contain calcium and or carbonates. And these are important here because, um, as you may know, in soils, the nutrients in soils come from two different places, primarily. One is the rocks below, and two is the organic matter above. All right? And um, so we looked a little bit at our New England geologic history, 
and there's all sorts of little ribbons of calcareous soil from those ancient seabeds, those old carbonates and seashells that are in there. They're fascinating. It's just those ribbons that are going to provide an opportunity for a rich fan to form. Here in this picture, we can see a little bit of those. We can at least see the significant connection. So these are all pockets here. Notice how shallow this is. Shallow, shallow water. And these little things here, <coughs> these little white patches, it's hard to tell in this photograph, those are minerals very much on the surface. Okay? We kind of have very little decomposition here, but we have a high mineral influence. All right? And if those minerals are calcium and carbonates, then, then we're really lined up to make a cool, rich fan here. All right, so that's one of the things that's going to make this from, compared to the intermediate. Uh, so we have poor fans, which, which uh, do not have the cal cal uh, carbonate history and calcium um, uh, mineral source from the rocks, um, and thus the, uh, we'll leave that for a second here. And then we have a rich fan which does have the calcic, uh, calcareous rocks and the uh, carbonate influence from the geology. Uh, important thing to understand that's a little bit a little bit complex momentarily is is the chemistry involved when it comes to acids and bases and rocks breaking down and minerals and nutrients being soluble in water. Um, being soluble is important as far as being available to plants and animals. And so uh, um, calcareous rocks and carbonate rocks um, uh, make many more nutrients available. Okay? And thus uh, decomposition happens a little more readily here, and so we don't get a sphagnum mat buildup. All right? So mineral substrate, we get this idea that there was no central channel there. It's a laminar flow across the whole surface. And that introduces our idea of a rich fan. It's really neat. We have a neat area here. We've got, geologically, we've got a kind of an isolated depression. All right, that's setting the scene a little bit. Underneath, we have calcium-rich bedrock with the carboniferous rocks as well underneath. Um, and it's going to have a high pH. High pH is, uh, is uh, means that a lot of hydrogen ions available, and so uh, these are areas that are between six and seven and a half pH, 7.5 or so pH. Uh, in general, shallow, seepy water. All right. Uh, in Vermont, these are all quite small areas. The water's going to move very slowly. It's coming up from the ground primarily, going through the cal calcareous rocks, the carboniferous rocks. Going to pick up those minerals on its way come to the surface, slowly move through the community, just feeding all that stuff. It's fabulous, you know. Uh, they'll have a few open pools, mineral rich. When they come through that, that rock substrate, they're going to bring food and minerals for the plants. Um, we get a shallow peat area, all right? It doesn't build up very much because the peat grows, and there it grows, and it dies, and it breaks down very quickly because the minerals are available. Water is available, and the oxygen is right there on the surface because it's quite shallow. All right. So instead, we're dominated by more brown mosses. Um, uh, what you think of as typical moss in a slightly forested situation, or species of sphagnum that typically stay brown. I'm kind of simplifying a little bit just to keep the story going a bit. Then sedges. All right. These cool grass-like plants, typically three-sided. And trees are involved a lot in their flower structure and their seed structure and so on. And very spar sparse shrubs, you know, very sparse shrub <sighs> All right. So that's basically a rich fen. What I want to do is let's take a look at some of the plants that are there. Uh, these are ones that are very typical of this kind of community. Sedges. We've seen them. We never knew what they were. They're different from the other grasses. We don't mow these very much, all right? Car oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't able. I didn't put the common names to some of the sedges. I, uh, they didn't come immediately to mind. And anybody that knows sedges probably doesn't use the common names. Carex hysteracina. This is a very common sedge like this. It does stick up a little bit. Um, it's actually, it's not all that common. It tends to be in more richer areas. We have some longer ones, Carex carnida, drooping sedge. 
that uh, goes a little bit longer. Here's this Carex Flava. Uh, it, it turns quite gold and yellow, and a little bit of brown in the summertime. You can find that in ditches as well. Uh, Carex Interior. Uh, there are several that are kind of the spiky star shape. And those, those are a little bit small, but um, um, if this is an introduction to sedges, you see that they're quite different from grasses. And uh, if you are a kind of a botanically oriented person, I uh, highly encourage you to, to get involved in these. They are manageable. You can learn them with just a little bit of vocabulary. So these are some of the ones that are very typical of a rich fen community. Um, we go on to some other ones here. And most of these are at um, Esquibog. Um, the one on the right is not. Uh, but uh, Leptilea is another one here. I'm sorry, I don't have a better picture, but uh, that's what we have. This is Carriage and Triculata, which was at that, uh, when we looked at that much larger fed, um, it was in that area. But just a, a beautiful thing that looks like a ear of corn. So sedges are quite important. If you take the time to learn the sedges, you'll find that they are really reflective of a particular environmental condition. So that as you learn your sedges, when you find a particular sedge, you're going to know that, ooh, there's a particular profile here, whether it be moisture regime or an acid base kind of regime. So sedges are very important in this kind of natural community. Uh, Dasifora floribunda here, you know, is shrubby sink foil. Um, one of the, the, the sink foils that we see the kinds that are in our lawn that are much smaller. This is neat because it grows to about this big. Globe flower, I believe it's also called perhaps. And uh, you can find this all over the place in the northwest in Alaska and the Yukon. All over because that's almost like one big fan up there. And, uh, very nice plant there. Um, uh, typically leaves in groups of three a little bit like a clover. Three to fives, so, you know. Lobelia calmii is a beautiful, delicate, thin, slightly grassy looking plant with a very nice uh, blue flower, right in five or six inches of water, eight inches of water, and uh, it's really super. Um, I love the uh, starry false Solomon seal. Uh, we see, you may know false Solomon seal in the, in the woods, and it has the gray berries at the end, the flower stalk at the end, and, and the berries turn red later on. They are edible. Uh, or fabulous kind of cranberry flavored thing that is just great. Well, this is a much smaller starry false Solomon seal, which will be typical there. Also can find that on the edges of uh, river shores, river flood plains, of smaller rivers, but uh, more in a richer setting. But this is a neat one here, and uh, the buck bean, Mayanthes, um, Manianthes trifoliata, is really the only one you're going to find in a rich fen kind of setting. Now, we talked about this community as being a spectrum. Understand that sometimes you can have a large water body that can have one or two or three different kinds of natural communities in it. So sometimes, Abbey Pond over in Bristol. You go over there, there's a great big pond, there's cattails over here, you get into all these sedges over here, and you get into a community that's a little bit like this here. And there's a fen that is just a part of it. So make sure you don't think of these as being, this body is this way only, but it, it can uh, actually be a bit of a spectrum. And, uh, but bog bean here, buck bean I mean, is going to uh, suggest to you that there's a real richness there in calcareous soils. Quite uh, uh, unique to intermediate and rich fens. Neat flower, isn't it? You know, mm -hmm. the way it's all kind of yeah. foamy, hairy thing up there. Just beautiful. <laughs> Bet you didn't know we had a we have a oh. native buckthorn. <laughs> oh, there's glossy buckthorn up there at uh, at Esqua as well. But there's a native buckthorn, which is really neat. We have wow. common buckthorn, glossy buckthorn. We're killing them, pulling them left and right. But this is a native buckthorn. Again, like the buck, uh, buck bean, you're going to see them side by side very often. Yeah. Um, again, indicators of the rich fen calcareous soils there. I didn't get. I didn't have any pictures of the berries being ripe, but uh, really neat. If you go out there, maybe a quarter of the way out the uh, the, the boardwalk, 
on the right hand side, you'll find these things here. Basically, uh, your first showy lady slippers right across from them, and before your white bog work is going to be right in that area. All right. I love this one here, Parnassia Glauca. Really beautiful little thing here. Uh, sometimes this basil rosette can just be hidden down in the sedges, and you hardly notice it. Uh, any other time of year, but when it's in flower, you go, wow, look at this. This is some kind of suit. I want a suit made like that. <laughs> uh, absolutely beautiful flower, maybe 15, 16, 17 inches tall. Really gorgeous. Very nice plants. Grass of Parnassus. Parnassus, again, shows you the problem of common names. It is not a grass at all. <laughs> Just a beautiful plant. Gium Ravale is quite common throughout many wetlands. Uh, happens to be one of the more com common uh, GMs out there. And uh, whoops, I'm sorry. I uh, this is a uh, Senecio aria. I forgot to a uh, golden ragwort. I forgot to uh, label that as well. Um, I think I was probably so excited about my photo of the close up there. <laughs> golden ragwort, also quite common. You can find you can find both of these in other wetlands at all. The GM is really quite common. And that is full bloom. That is all the color it ever has. Mm -hmm. Neat little plant, though. And of course, we get to the orchids, which seems to be what it's all about. Uh, Cypripedium parviflorum. You may know that there are three different varieties of this. Parviflorum variety pubescens, a variety parviflorum, and variety macassin. And um, uh, in Vermont, I don't believe we have all three. We mostly have pubescence and, uh, and perhaps some macassin. The others are a much smaller little thing here. So this beautiful flower here, notice these uh, uh, sepals out here are quite dark and they're all twisted, which is really gorgeous there. This is a pretty good sized flower, uh, so an inch and a half or, or a little bit more maybe. The other two varieties are much smaller, maybe only an inch long. But it's gorgeous to find here, and uh, really just a neat plant. Uh, uh, grows typically singularly, as far as flowers go, or singularly on, on each stalk, very much like our Akali, the pink lady slipper in woodland area. Platanthera dilatata, which is really neat. Um, you never know when the flowers are going to be in bloom. This should be pink right now. This year, we're a little bit late, so it'll be in about 10 days. And uh, uh, But the Greenberg's got a beautiful, look at the size of that. Isn't that gorgeous, huh? Are all these at Eshquabog? These are at Eshquabog, yeah. There are some out of some, there. Are some, some out. There are some out. We there are, yeah. yeah. It'll yeah. start, a few. so a few. they'll start slowly, a little bit like that. And uh, just beautiful things there. And you can see the spiders are in there hunting. And then... Uh, but in uh, July 4th weekend, probably, they'll be just loaded like this, mm -hmm. and uh, absolutely beautiful. Pure white, uh, it it's, it's, uh, kind of defines white, that color. It's really very nice, you know. Mm -hmm. Platanthera hirenensis, this is the Lake Huron bog green orchid. Uh, this is interesting, because you, you don't see a lot of green flowers. Um, you know, I probably should have added it here, but um, there's another green flower out there that is fabulous and is so common. You've seen it a million times, but it's really worth looking out there. So first of all, look at this nice delicate orchid here with this little lip and everything is green. And, and you wonder from an adaptation strategy as far as attracting bugs and so on, what, what, uh, what's the plan for this flower? Um, but also take advantage of Eshquabog for the, um, the false hellebore, Raptor viridae. Last year was absolutely gorgeous, and I had such perfect pictures. So you know this a little bit like skunk cabbage, but it's not. It grows tall, and uh, uh, flowers come out. There's numerous big button flowers, and they're pure green. Green is a leaf, and again, you wonder about that strategy, and last year was a fabulous year for them, and uh, really quite beautiful. These white highlights are not here. It's only here because of the projection. They're, they're not really in the photo. But uh, look at the false hellebore up there. It's right on the edge of the boardwalk, not even halfway down, and it's fabulous. But this, uh, this little orchid is, uh, is there as well, and uh, it's just beautiful. Again, 
this area is really, so we've already seen a few orchids, and you can see it's quite special. And you can see that, you can imagine that these are really quite delicate. So you really don't want to get off of the boardwalk, you know. Um, there are years when the orchids can be a little dormant, uh, dormant and not be up. And so you may not know it, but you're, you're going to see what you think is six or eight orchids. And then uh, two years ago, there were a hundred right there. So they're there underneath, but they're dormant. But if you put your feet on them, and they'll be really dormant, mm -hmm. right? And so you have to be careful in approaching orchids that way. So again, stay on the uh, stay on the boardwalk, get a tripod, and get some nice shots of these kinds of things. And of course, then there's the Cypripedium regini. Let me tell you, <laughs> I don't have one slide of these. I have a few of them. <laughs> Going through the this is what I call the two-story orchid. All right, this thing grows up. It's got multiple heads. It's got it's got leaves sticking out all over. It's absolutely gorgeous. There are numerous ones. Very large flower here, probably about that big, right? Absolutely gorgeous. Go on Fourth of July weekend. They'll be peaking this year. It'll be fabulous. No, they're peaking right now. Oh, are they out that many? Oh yeah, oh, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Are loads yes. right now? Yes. Yeah. I would never have thought I had them out there. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Everyone they, else I've seen, they are absolutely gorgeous. So really good. So tomorrow will be a nice visit. Oh, tomorrow will be gorgeous. It'll be gorgeous. There I hope one, you join Amanda for the walk tomorrow. Yeah, there is one green ball working out too. Oh, good. By good. the by the board by the second part of the boardwalk, almost at the end of the boardwalk on near, the right. The near the Labrador Tea. Near the Labrador Tea. Yeah. The Labrador uh, isn't that fabulous? Right. Well, you know. You'll sit there and shoot these things. It'll drive you crazy because you want to show people. <laughs> Again, these aren't nearly as blown out as they are, but uh, only because of the projection on, on these things. But absolutely gorgeous. Take the time to look closely at the structure in here. It's fabulous, and uh, they are really just gorgeous, and you can't shoot enough of them. And good luck figuring out which one you're going to show to your friends because you'll have hundreds. <laughs> and, uh, but there are other neat things and not so neat. Mm -hmm. Quick little story here. Um, we're up in the upland part of things, which is fascinating with uh, all sorts of good ferns. There's another orchid up there, Galliaris spectabilis, the showy orchid. And uh, that's more of a ground forest kind of woodland orchid that's just beautiful. And uh, some neat ferns. Patricium dissectum is dissected, or cut leaf grape fern, I believe it's called and uh, quite interesting up there. It does have two different forms. One which is, uh, oh, kind of a big triangular leaf and it's cut a bit. And then there's the other one which is the big triangular leaf and it's cut like crazy. It looks like real fern, really cut. And there they are within 10 feet of each other, same species, just slight differences in variety. I was looking for those and I tried to find them again because I took these two pictures. Make a long story short, I was keeping an eye out for those and also for this Patricium tenebrosum. This plant is about this tall. And we were going to dump some weeds, not so neat. This wall let us bad news out there. It's a bit of a problem. And uh, we're pulling it, trying to manage for these. We're also getting rid of buckthorn here and there, trying to manage these things. And, um, and, uh, and in part of that process, I was returning to the truck and not a foot off the road with this little guy. And this is perfect. I shot a hundred of these shots. And it's very hard to get everything in focus. And here they are big, of course. They're not a four-foot plant. But uh, that is full bloom. That is, doesn't get better than that. <laughs> you know, it's, and, and maybe I have a better shot, but uh, it was very hard to get better than that. Really neat. That is the full form of that fern. And, uh, are you willing to divulge where it is? Just this far off the road. Garvin Hill Road, Peshkwa Bog, that's it. I mean, if, if, you know what, the, the, you're not going to take this, and it, you know, you, it wouldn't survive if you did. It is, uh, what, what would that be? Uh, that's south of the parking area. So typically if you drive up from town and you get to the parking area, I don't know, maybe 100 feet past that on the right. Thank you. And uh, it's in that area, but it is this far off the road. I just was going to crush it. And there were several of them, but that guy was perfect. And darned if I can get a good picture of him. 
And, uh, and also, you know, don't forget the bugs, the birds, fabulous area. There are some interesting uh, dragonflies that can be in, uh, in these ridge farms, um, you know, fens, and, uh, and very neat. And, uh, you know, but these <laughs> things don't just take care of themselves. Uh, you know, Nature Conservancy and New England Wildflower, um, you know, try to keep an eye on things and take, a, take care of things. But also, there's a group of volunteers out there that are community members of yours, um, and, and some from the past who have probably also toiled a bit in the area. And, um, you know, I'd like to, uh, you know, recognize that these folks are involved and care about these places. You're here in the immediate community and can go and keep an eye on this and respond to any issues going on there. And uh, Greenbergs, would you raise your hand? These folks are our stewards, and um, you know, more on a regular basis, go there, visit there, think about what needs to be done, and communicate with us as to what needs to be done at the sanctuary there. And uh, obviously, put their backs into it, and uh, you know, are working to take care of things here. Kate Reeves is another gal from uh, from the area, and uh, who also has been involved in the past. You know, so. Uh, uh, I want to just thank them in general for, uh, for taking care of this property. And don't forget, it's not just about the orchids. You can go there other times of the year. Fabulous wildlife in the area, and uh, maybe just a, a piece of solace for you. So uh, come again, be a friend of a fen. <laughs> Chickering Bog at the bottom, which is another rich fen uh, up north. Another neat place to go. You can see it's much larger and a little bit different. Well, I want to thank you very much for well, coming out. Yeah.